Alright, hi everyone. So today my presentation is going to be on visual effects in movies and TV shows. And the purpose of this presentation is to just um, kind of show you the evolution of um, just visual effects. So kind of give you to kind of give you like a little bit of history, the first type of animation or like visual effects that started out were illustrations. And so they, the first animation uh, they made was, or the earliest surviving animation short was humorous phases of funny faces. And what they used was a single frame method where they just um, have single images projected and they just project them at, a, at frames per second. Um, so for this um, animation short, they, all they had was just like a chalkboard and an animator would draw um, each character and kind of like go through the whole, I guess, storyline. Um, and in the beginning, you kind of see what the animator looks like and how he's drawing it, but later on that was taken out um, with stop motion. And then another surviving like animation short is called Dirty the Dinosaur, which is from 1914. And it's known as the first surviving like animation um, cartoon. Um, and then, so animation um, shorts, they were developed in shorts until the first feature length movie, which was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which was released on December 27, 1937. I mean, 21, sorry. Um, so, to kind of give you an idea, this picture right here is from Humorous Faces and Funny Faces. Um, and as you can see, it's just a chalkboard um, and with the characters drawn on it. Every time the characters needed to do something, the animator would kind of erase and draw again, erase and draw again. This is Gertie the Dinosaur. As you can see, it's just a sketch, nothing more than that. And it was this um, short bit was, I think, like 12 minutes long. And then here you have um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which you can see is hand-drawn and colored and a lot more advanced than those two. Then going on to miniatures. So Metropolis uh, from 1927 is a movie that, was that used miniatures. Um, to kind of create like a dystopian feel and these two pictures are from that movie and you can kind of see um, the people and the little tiny cars and this is kind of part of their um, miniature, like the look. You guys can see properly, right, the pictures? Okay. Um, and this is also the same, mo um, same movie and they're just kind of setting up, you see the people right here, kind of setting up the build uh, buildings in the back. Um, Trip to the Moon was actually the first to use um, miniatures, including a model spaceship, and then the idea of using like a model spaceship was later used in um, Star Wars and Star Trek until you know they were digitalized. And the miniatures are still used today in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. That's one of the most famous kind of used miniatures now. Um, so the next type of animation that, were, that was used was matte paintings and stop motion. So Wizard of Oz uses uh, these matte paintings, and as you can see, like right here. This is this whole thing in the back is a matte painting that was uh, projected for the characters to kind of you know walk towards and just kind of do that scene. <clears throat> and studios back then actually had their own departments that would create these matte paintings for specific scenes, specific movies. Um, and then for stop motion, Jason and the Argonauts is this picture right here. This is these skeletons are all um, kind of like puppets or like objects that they moved and like you know photographed and manipulated in um, whatever scene they wanted or whatever way they needed to be. Um, and then the next is motion control and makeup. So Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope was, the, was one of the first few um, in, like, animations to use a motion control system. And this right here is the motion control system that they use. And it just makes it easier to kind of um, get different angles. For example, like with a spaceship, you would need to see how it moves. And if you look right here, the camera is right here, and this part at the top is what moves around um, in like a 360 angle, and it moves up in all different angles. So you can get all different sides of the, I guess, the spaceship. Um, and then for makeup, um, 1981's horror comedy and American Werewolf in London was, um, they opted to use prosthetics and robotic limbs instead of you know, doing any other type of animation or you know, having the actor like hide behind a bush or, um, yeah, just, that's pretty much it. And that brings me to what we currently use, which is animation CGI. So CGI stands for uh, computer-generated imagery. And up until 
Toy Story, Disney had perfected their um, hand-drawn graphics and hand-drawn movies, so as we saw in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and like all their movies after that, they were all hand-drawn until they joined up with um, Pixar to create Toy Story, and this took four years to make, um, and they had to pay attention to a lot more detail and kind of work how, um, kind of work the actors and like what they were saying into um, how they would create these characters. Um, another thing that's used today is green screens. Um, because of the because of new software that's available, green screen makes it really easy to uh, create movies now. Um, and green screens don't actually have to be green. The idea of having a green screen is to have a color, a screen that's furthest away from your skin tone. Um, and they could be like blue, red, whatever. Um, so basically the screens are recorded and made transparent with special software. And here are some pictures. So right there is the movie um, World of Empire. And so you can see the green screen is right here. And then the after image is what this is. And then the Great Gatsby. You can see 1920s New York City is not as bright or as crowded as it seems here. So this is the original. This is what they filmed. And you can see the green screen in the back. And then this was all added with CGI. Um, so you can see an Iron Man right here. He's not actually wearing the suit. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. had, well, the director had Robert Downey Jr. wear a bodysuit. And then the Iron Man suit was later added on um, with CGI. And then Alice in Wonderland, um, so the whole idea of like Wonderland was created with CGI, with like the green screens, even these actors in the background wearing green screens so they can be um, really animated. And then the last thing is motion capture. So motion capture kind of is just a process of um, recording movement um, of any uh, of objects or people. And then in filmmaking and game, video game development, it refers to uh, the little like subtle actions that um, the actors make. Um, so I actually have a movie clip from um, Avatar to show you, and they talk about how they use motion capture to film the movie. Solve it quickly. Um, I have to keep this thing running because I don't know how to put movies together. But If, if worse comes to worse, you put it on your laptop and hold it up. I have it here. Yeah.
Yeah, okay. Well, you can just continue. I'll zoom in so it'll look like it's uh, on the... Can you guys see? I hope you guys can see. This is like the main purpose of my presentation. Yeah, I don't want visual effects. I don't have to work Is that yep. okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So this is from the movie Avatar, and they're kind of talking about um, how they used um, motion capture to make the entire movie. Oh, sorry. Is the display being off mute? Yeah. Up? Mm -hmm. I need those things. Yes. Okay. You know this would happen? Because of the nature of this film, you know, with, it, with this alien clan, this alien culture, you know, we had a choice. We could do it with makeup, like it's always been done, you know, rubber appliance makeup. It would have looked horrible and it would have been boring and stupid, and, you know, a ton of blue actors running around in the rainforest in their underwear, you know, and a bunch of blue body paint. It would look terrible. Uh, and I wasn't interested in that. You know, if I was going to do this, I wanted to do it this way, which is with performance capture. But before he could do that, Cameron first had to make sure his technology could cross what's known in robotics and animation as the uncanny valley. And let's say this is an absolute human, uh, and this is a, you know, kind of a talking moose. You know, as you approach human, our attraction to the character goes down. And then at the last second, just when you get to a true human look, it goes back up. Well, we needed to get on the far side of that dip in the response curve, which is called the Uncanny Valley. And we needed to get to the opposite side, where we believe, we don't have to necessarily believe that it's 100% photo real, and we don't have to necessarily, necessarily believe that they actually exist, but we have to believe in them as emotional creatures. And so we came up with the, um, the head rig. We call it the head rig. It's basically just a, a kind of helmet, very tight, conformal kind of skull cap that's based on a, on a uh, life cast of the actor's head, and a laser scan. So it fits very tightly and smoothly and comfortably. And then, uh, you know, there's a carbon fiber boom that comes out with a little camera on the front of it. And that camera shoots the face in a nulled out close up. So even though the actor's moving all around, running, jumping, yelling, screaming, jumping off stuff, jumping over logs, you know, running flat out, whatever, we're getting that facial performance absolutely locked off. And from that, as you can see, like they could have easily used makeup, but putting on makeup for all those characters would have taken a long time, and it was just easier to do it that way because the programs give you a lot more um, flexibility. And I have one more video clip to show you, and that's the this video clip is what inspired this whole presentation. It's from the movie Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and it's kind of explaining um, beyond what they just said. Everybody's seen chimpanzees, everybody's seen orangutans, and know how they're supposed to look. So I think the bar in terms of needing to make photorealistic characters is really high. So we had to go to the best people in the business to do visual effects in this movie. Weta had the experience from Kong, Avatar, and Lord of the Rings. One of the improvements in motion capture since Avatar really have to do with detail and the type of imagery that they're getting out of the cameras gives us more facial information. And that subtlety is what's going to make the apes work, which is going to be very different. You don't get a chance to look at apes' eyes like you will see in this movie. So, for this specific movie, they had to pay much more attention on little details like to make the characters look like real apes. And 
they kind of did that with like their own model department, which is, I guess, the rest of the video part. So. Started with the concept art, and we started to use those as a basis of designing our characters. And then from there, it goes to the creatures department, which they're working on the whole muscular system, the skeletal system, and the way that the apes would actually move. Then it would come to the textures department, where we had to actually put in all the very fine wrinkles on all the characters. At the same time, the model department are doing the groom, laying out the fur, and handing that off to shaders as well so that they can apply a hair that then goes to the shots department where everything comes together. So the creatures really do have the correct anatomical layers. They have muscles and fat and skin and make them as realistic as possible. Obviously when you work with a wetter, it could be safe in the knowledge that they're going to come up with something pretty great, but we were attempting to do something that had never been done before. And my first reaction to seeing it was, that's Andy Serkis looking like a chip. And that's what's so amazing, is you see his performance. What we did differently on Rise of the Apes from what we did on Avatar is we brought the performance capture into the live action location. Wham! In a way, it's probably the best thing that happened to Mocha. We've been shooting in the stage without sunlight for like 10 years. We are on the set of the Golden Gate Bridge. This is the largest mocap volume in the world, and the first time it's been done outside. So Weta is basically changing all the rules with motion capture. That was good. Yeah. So basically the idea is that um, using motion capture, CGI, and green screen, it just allows a lot more um, creativity, and now all, almost all movies are you know, starting to do this. Um, because they really don't have to worry about like lighting because they do that with artificial lighting or, or you know just fixing up like the colors and everything on their specific software. And or and they also don't need to worry about like gaming or anything. Yeah. I can do that.